Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. My name is Dean Godson, Director of Policy Exchange, and uh, the area of uh, the topic of lawfare against uh, British troops has been uh, one that Policy Exchange is proud to have played a prominent part in having put on the national agenda, having started 2013 with uh, the publication by Tom Tugendhat and Laura Croft Klein, uh, Fog of Law, followed by, uh, in the following year, Clearing the Fog of Law, again by uh, Tom Richard Eakins and uh, Jonathan Morgan of Corpus Christi College, uh, Cambridge. As many of you will know, it, uh, then uh, the issue then went into, uh, became of interest to a number of political parties. It, uh, this subject, uh, doing something about this lawfare against British troops, appeared in the Conservative Manifesto of 2015. It also appeared in the Conservative Manifesto of 2017. Other political parties also expressed uh, interest in it. And what this uh, topic of the subject today is really just to take a look at what's been achieved in that period, what remains to be done to address this topic. We have uh, a panel that uh, combines those with uh, operational uh, military experience, uh, both uh, academic and uh, practical legal experience, and uh, it's a, a people with ministerial experience, and now Tom Tugendhat who served uh, and others who've served who've uh, got uh, experience in Parliament of uh, trying to amend the laws and amend the approach of the executive towards this matter to ensure that uh, British forces are afforded the protection that they deserve, both for past operations, present and future. Although I'm uh, reminded of uh, what uh, Lieutenant General Sir Paul Newton, a uh, retired general and one of the important thinkers in British army and armed forces in recent years observed, he said, there is no such thing as an historical inquiry. Every historical inquiry has a direct impact upon the mindset and the culture and the way of thinking of present day troops who will be wondering whether they will be facing uh, similar inquiries, similar inquests and similar lawsuits uh, to the ones that uh, many of the veterans uh, are now presently facing from conflicts, many of which are a very long time ago. So it's a privilege to be able to welcome our panel, particularly perhaps uh, welcome back in the first instance, uh, the author here today who kicked it off, Tom Tugendhat, MP for Tunbridge and Morling, now chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, who's re retained his weather eye on the subject. Tom, we look forward to having to what, hear, hearing what you have to say. Well then, after all our speakers have spoken, mm -hmm. we'll throw it open to the floor for questions as always, House rule, no question too outrageous. You just have to state your name and organization first. Tom, thank you for coming to our other panelists. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Policy exchange has gone from being a, an entertainment value in a think tank to an obstacle course. <laughs> um, it's a huge pleasure to be with you here today. About six years ago, um, I was getting married, and I don't know if you remember <laughs> your honeymoons particularly well, but I remember mine vividly. And, and one of the stories of my honeymoon that I think is really important to share is that Dean was there too. <laughs> because while I was supposed to be on honeymoon, I was actually writing Fog of Law, and Dean was, I'm not joking, emailing various different updates and drafts to the hotel, to the joy of my, uh, thank God, still wife. Um, it wasn't obvious at the time that that would be the result. But in the past six years, we have uh, stayed married, we have got two children, and we've written, or rather, Dean and I have written, this is our special moment, um, have, have come together to write um, uh, the second version of Fog of Law, Clearing the Fog of Law, with Richard and, and others. But over that time, the government has achieved substantially less. In fact, I would argue the uh, government has achieved almost nothing. Because the reality is that the continued prosecution of uh, British Army uh, and indeed Royal Marine, Navy and Air Force personnel has continued. Despite the recommendations that we made, despite uh, the call that we made to look hard at the various different operations we were conducting, how they should be conducted, what jurisdictions should be applied, despite the cooperation and indeed extremely uh, generous support of the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, to use the appropriate uh, law, the British government's position has remained unchanged. Now this is a real, really sad indictment on 
a list of uh, conservative, I'm sorry to say, defense secretaries over the last six years and a great indictment of the government. Now, this isn't, as Dean rightly says, this isn't actually a historical exercise. This isn't some sort of perverse academic inquiry into whether or not people who fought 30 or 40 years ago should be subject to civilian jurisdiction rather than to the jurisdiction that we know is appropriate to combat operations. This is actually a very fundamental question on how Her Majesty's government is able to deploy forces who are then able to exercise force to defend our nation. This is really a very fundamental question on whether or not the strong can protect the weak, or whether, frankly, it's every man for himself, every person for themselves, and nobody can be asked to do anything that anyone else couldn't be asked to do as well. And the reason that's important is because, as Dean quite rightly puts it, this is not historic. These inquiries are shaping the actions and behaviors of young corporals and young lieutenants today. They're shaping their decisions in battle. They're shaping their willingness, their ability to make the split-second decisions that make the difference between success and failure in operations. And that's why I'm back talking about the same subject again. And well, I'm very glad to see a very impressive cast. Now, I'm going to update it a bit because I've had the privilege of reading Richard Eakin's latest work, which I hope you're going to talk a bit about, which comes out with uh, various recommendations. And they are mostly to do with amendments to the Human Rights Act and how uh, the European Court of Human Rights should be used and should be uh, obeyed in these circumstances. Because, of course, the European Court of Human Rights is not always followed to the letter, as we've seen with prisoners voting. So there are various ways in which governments do interpret uh, jurisdiction and uh, decision making. And Richard also touches on issues of Northern Ireland, which we didn't particularly touch on in Fog of Law and Clearing the Fog of Law. So I think all those together really update this question brilliantly. But the fundamental question still applies. Can you recruit a class of volunteer? Can you train them? Can you then ask them to do things that are truly extraordinary and that you could not morally, legitimately, legally ask civilians to do? And if you can, if you think that those things are necessary for the defense of our nation, for the defense of democracy, indeed for the standing up to evil around the world, which is what we've used our military to do over the last 15, 20 years. If you think you can do those things, what are you willing to do to make sure that they are not then subject to faux justice, to the kind of tank chasing lawyers that we've seen from people like Phil Shiner over the last decade? This question is, I'm sorry to say, still very much alive, and it is still our watch, and we really must fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, just if you take it, do you want to do it from a standing? I'll take a stand. Okay. Thank you, Dean. Well, let me say at the outset that um, it has been my privilege to work with, with Tom and Policy Exchange on this issue over the last few years, and I should uh, take a moment to note that none of that work really would have been possible without Dean's energy and vision. The question we are asking today is what the next Prime Minister should do to protect our troops from lawfare. And the answer I'll outline for you briefly, which uh, foreshadows some of what you'll find in a lengthier paper next week, which Tom has mentioned. My answer is that the Prime Minister, the next Prime Minister, should introduce legislation to the House of Commons to amend the Human Rights Act 1998 and should also introduce legislation bringing to an end, or at least sharply curtailing, the legal legacy of the Troubles. The main vehicle for lawfare against UK troops, as many in the room will know, has been the European Convention on Human Rights, and especially rulings interpreting that convention by the European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg. 
But equally important, and sometimes overlooked, has been the domestic reception of the Strasbourg Court's decisions. And it's the Human Rights Act that determines the domestic legal effect of that case law. It's true and important that even apart from the Human Rights Act, the UK would remain party to the European Convention and at risk of being challenged before the Strasbourg Court. But the effect of the Human Rights Act, especially as it's been interpreted by our courts in recent years, has been to make it much harder for the UK authorities to exercise the freedom they need to protect UK troops. The authorities have been operating under constant risk of domestic legal challenge, with British courts requiring ongoing investigation of UK troops, whether serving or retired, and entertaining legal challenges to operations, including while UK troops are in the field. And these risks have arisen partly because the Human Rights Act has been misinterpreted by our courts. In other words, the solution, in relation to this problem at least, is not necessarily repealing the Act, but amending it to restore its intended scope and application. In relation to Northern Ireland and investigations uh, into deaths during the Troubles, it's worth noting the Human Rights Act came into force in October 2000, so two years after the Good Friday Agreement. In 2004, the House of Lords, which at that time was our highest court, uh, held authoritatively that the Human Rights Act did not apply to events that took place before the Act came into force. In other words, and this was the context of the judgment question, one could not rely on the Human Rights Act to require the authorities to investigate or to reinvestigate deaths that took place during the Troubles. The Act did not permit our courts to demand new or more extensive investigations. In 2011, in response to a Strasbourg Court judgment, the Supreme Court abandoned that principled position and began to apply the Human Rights Act retrospectively to deaths that took place before the Act came into force. The late Lord Roger dissented forcefully, warning that the majority's decision could not be squared with Parliament's intentions in enacting the Human Rights Act in 1998. And subsequent decisions of our highest courts have confirmed that position and taken it further. What is now needed is legislation to restore the Act's intended meaning, to prevent its retrospective application to deaths that took place during the Troubles. That would help restore a measure of discretion to investigating and prosecuting authorities, discretion which has, uh, has been a long, has long, long since been an important feature of our criminal justice system. But there is a strong case for the next Prime Minister to introduce legislation providing more specific protection to those who served in Northern Ireland. <coughs> That legislation might simply draw a line under the past, as the Attorney General for Northern Ireland proposed in 2013, or it might rule out reinvestigations or prosecutions unless compelling new evidence has emerged and it's in the interests of justice to proceed. Let me mention briefly litigation concerning actions of our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. The problem in that case has again been one, partly at least, of unfairly changing the rules after the fact. In 2011, the Strasbourg Court wrongly chose to extend the reach of the European Convention on Human Rights, making it apply, with retrospective effect, to military operations that had already been undertaken. That's had a far-reaching impact on, within our domestic law, because our courts have understood the Human Rights Act to apply wherever the Strasbourg Court says the Convention applies. In 2007, our House of Lords ruled by majority that the Human Rights Act had some limited extraterritorial application. But they took for granted it wouldn't simply apply worldwide. And the dissenting judge, Lord Bingham, reasoned that the Act only applied within the United Kingdom. The next Prime Minister should introduce legislation to restore the limited extraterritorial application of the Human Rights Act, to limit its uh, extensive and expansive extraterritorial application, taking us back to the legal position in 2007. That would bring to an end legal action in our courts to require investigations or reinvestigations. It would also prevent many legal challenges to ongoing operations. There's much more to be said, and there'll be more to be said in, in the paper next week, as we say, uh, but that uh, would be all I will say about the, the matter today. Thank you. Richard, thank you. Another superb briefing. Admiral Allen, the only former service chief and only former minister here present. Well, you can say only stellar. Only sailor, but also um, just in the Labour Party, maintaining uh, the uh, bipartisan, multipartisan nature of this enterprise. I know why I was asked. I know why I was asked. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, uh, and I have to agree, say I agree with Tom. I think we have we have just done nothing, and I think that is 
That is a, a pretty appalling indictment of us, in fact. Although, very interesting to hear some of your ideas. It's very interesting. I was at an event, a D-Day event, um, at Rusi, um, and a Normandy veteran was speaking. Uh, always fascinating hearing these chaps. He was talking about how he was a, he was a commando. Uh, he was with the commando uh, brigade. He was saying how dang frightening and everything it was. And he quite casually said, in the, in the course of what he was saying, he basically admitted to a war crime. He said, fighting the Waffen-SS, who uh, we'd taken a couple of prisoners. They had gone behind our lines. They then pulled out a grenade and killed some people. They were you know, pretty bloody the whole time. He said, I just didn't take prisoners. I shot them if they tried to surrender to me. So he casually was admitting to a war crime. And the reason I raised that is because it is so dangerous post hoc and so long afterwards to make judgments yeah. about what the circumstances were when these things were taking place. And too often, I'm afraid, um, the rules and laws and regulations and how they're applied, and I've seen it in coroner's courts back in the UK for things in Afghanistan, on a quiet sunny afternoon with the window open, over a period of three days, they are making judgments that someone's had to make in split second when he's been terrified himself, frightened about what's going on, scared of what will happen to his his uh, comrades or his men, uh, and it's so easy to do that um, and forget of what the real circumstances are. And that's why I think it's so important we get some of these right. And why it is so important, there has to be some time scale to some of these things. I mean, I just cannot imagine how we can get a sensible uh, court case against someone who was involved in an incident 45 years ago. It is hard enough immediately afterwards. I've been involved in you know, when a plane's crashed or something like that, one of the carriers I've been on, very quickly to find out what happened. Every single person tells you something different. I mean, some of them say it's a different type of bloody plane. And, you know, and this is immediately afterwards. When you're looking at this 20, 30, 40 years afterwards, how can we possibly think we will actually get justice? I just, I just can't see it. So I think the time scale issue is important, and people have talked about ways of, of applying that. As an aside, I do think, not in a state-on-state -state war, but in a lot of the wars we're involved in, this does play very much the terrorist agenda, and terrorists use this because by getting our people involved in these, in these ridiculous cases, um, effectively they're saying there's a moral equivalence to what they're doing with what our people are doing. And there is no moral equivalence. There is no moral equivalence whatsoever. The people we ask to join our military and then we send out around the world, or maybe in Northern Ireland's case, in part of the United Kingdom, um, really to to look after our security and the safety of our nation, um, they are not going out there with the intention of going and killing and maiming people. The terrorists, that is what they want to do. There is no moral equivalence. So playing this game, in a sense, and I use game advisedly, we're playing into their, into their hands uh, on it. And I think to, to end up, what I'd say is that as politicians, we all have an absolute moral responsibility to look after the men and women that we expect to go and do things which are extraordinary um, to look after the security of our nation. We, ha we have an absolute moral obligation, and I'm afraid we have not been fulfilling it. It is a disgrace that we are taking people through the courts, this case and all that, it's, a, it's an absolute disgrace. Now, I know we can't have a presumption of innocence, and I know we have to have the rule, rule of law, and there are some things that are totally unacceptable. But my goodness me, we've got it wrong at the moment. We've got to resolve it. I'm delighted that we're getting some of these ideas thought of. And we really must move forward and do something. I met 61 members of 4-2 four, four Commando outside the Lords just now. They're about to go in for their day of seeing what the place is like. And uh, one of them said to me, he said, I explained what we were doing this afternoon. And he said, sir, he said, so many of you say this is all wrong. He said, I thought governments were meant to be able to do things. Um, uh, am I, you know, Admiral, is that right? You know, what, what can you do? I, I couldn't answer the question. I could not answer it because we're not doing something. So this sort of uh, gathering is very, very important. We've got to do something. I don't know all the answers, my God, but I'd love to find someone who has got them. But I would love to see everything bent far over to look after our people, I'm afraid, rather than the other way. You know, being absolutely down the middle might sound wonderful, but we should be bending way over to look after our people. Thank you. I can call now on Julie Marionneau, former commandant of the Armée de l'Air in France, and uh, now with Policy Exchange, Julie, look forward to hearing what you have to say.
Thank you, Dean. I will do it from my seat as I have privilege to have a microphone. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for. So, uh, if I may, I mean, we have seen that the legal pursuit of our British soldiers and veterans in courts is one of the consequences of lawfare. And I would like to just focus a little bit more on the concept of lawfare um, itself as a recurring theme in the media. So, in asking ourselves, what do we mean exactly about lawfare? And does the definition of this short and term really matter? to provide political remedies to the current ply of our troops. And at last, if the UK is well equipped to respond to lawfare activities, or do, if we do actually need to think about a broader, all-encompassing counter-lawfare strategy to address the risk of an increasing weaponizing of the law. So what do we exactly mean by lawfare? Uh, prior to 2001, the term was used sporadically in various contexts, and it was then conceptualized and popularized by Major um, General Charles Dunlap in 2001 after the Kosovo campaign. Uh, he was the US Air Force JAG, and the idea behind that, it's, uh, of his definition, it was to coin a term that could uh, actually define a strategy of using or misusing the law as a substitute for traditional military means, I mean bombing, and kinetic actions, to achieve an operational military goal. And so this coin turn had mainly a didactic, was a didactic tool, it was a, uh, uh, a message he wanted to convey to help the military personnel to understand why the law needed to be incorporated into their thinking and into the planning. So you see, it was, I think, quite successful in his attempt, uh, in that sense, as we see today. But in recent years, the term, as we see, has been used in many ways, and above all, as a label to criticize those who use international law and legal proceeding to make claims against the states, and especially in the uh, context of national security and military operation. So example, we do have examples of lawfare everywhere, not only as we are today in the talking about the legal pursuits of our British troops into courts, but Russia, China, Iran directly or indirectly use proxy to create asymmetric regulation environment. So for example, state actors like Russia are applying new techniques. They use violence under certain legal threshold. So legal threshold that are actually, for example, useful to define an aggression or what is a, an attack. Very uh, handy, really practical when you think that um, from this definition depends the triggering, for example, of Article 5, the collective mechanism of collective defense with NATO on, a night in, uh, on the Washington Treaty. So also, I'm talking about state actors, but also non-state actors are using lawfare activity in an offensive way like terrorist group, like Lord West uh, mentioned, are using human shields. You mentioned are unlawful uh, according to law act, and this is <coughs> the point about using human shell because they prevent military law-abiding nation to our, to, that are acting in compliance with law act to, um, to target their, 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 their objectives. So this is, uh, I think, how lawfare resonates as a useful term to describe and understand the dynamic of the instrumental role uh, law can play, but there is also uh, I think we have to keep in mind there is not consensus completely on its exact meaning and scope. So on one hand, you have a lack of clarity of this concept, and on the other hand, you also have a rather negative connotation because we think about non-state actors, state actor who are using lawfare in an offensive way and scrupulous um, way, and that two elements are, I think, impeded, uh, pending, sorry, democratic law-binding nations such as the UK to properly understand two major points. First point, the usefulness of such concept to contemplate law not simply as a restraint or as an ethical yardstick, but also as a strategic partner and a force multiplier which should not be left in the hands of the non-state and uh, non-law-abiding non revision state actor. Second, the importance to develop a counter lawful strategy, at least in a military context, to regain operational effectiveness and to defend better the international, the preservation of the international rule-based order. So um, I think that leads me to my second point. So is a common definition and understanding of a definition of lawfare uh, really matter to provide a political remedies <coughs> to, um, to the current plight of our troops? 
I believe it's so. I think definitions always matter because it helps to identify all the aspects, the origin of a complex issue, like all Richard tried to do and we're trying to do in this report, you know, trying to go back in all the cases and finding what, why, how we did get there and why did we did not do anything su substantial to, um, to curtail this uh, uh, phenomenon. And also to find alternative solution by seeing what is happening uh, in a different country. So for example, just briefly in a nutshell, what is lawfare from a uh, European continental perspective? Uh, well, it seems to be more, lawfare seems to be more responsive in nature than in American and Israeli uh, uh, approach. For example, the, pref the French prefer even using the term juridification of the battlefield. And by using this term, they clearly show they have no intention to advocate an offensive practice of lawfare uh, in pursuit of policy objectives with ongoing, for example, hybrid <coughs> activities. By contrast, the American and the Israeli perspective seems to go uh, considerably further, further. They are more proactive. They defend an instrumental use of law for policy and um, military objective. As for the UK's perspective, it is quite interesting because we have quite a nice idea today of you know, the use of uh, lawfare uh, in this area, but it was nevertheless quite astonishing to read on the 12th report of the Defence Committee of the House of Commons entitled The UK Armed Forces Personnel and the Legal Framework for Future Operation, published in 2013, page 12, while not convinced of the validity of the concept of lawfare, we were concerned to see whether there was any evidence that the law had been deliberately misused in this way. So <laughs> these short conclusive remarks extracted from the, 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 the report itself brings us to raise two final questions. Is the UK well equipped to respond to lawfare activities? And do we actually need to think about a broader all-encompassing uh, counter lawfare strategy? And uh, what I take, I think, from today's uh, remarks, real briefly to tackle on this important question, uh, is that military actions have become legal actions, just as legal acts have become weapons. And I think this is a powerful sentence that summarizes all what has been said so far. And what is absolutely revolting, uh, such as the legal postures of our veterans or British troops, who acted in compliance with LOAC in the heat of the battle, take the decision, sometimes receive medal of honor for their bravery, is that we can see how powerful the legal tools has become and how vulnerable our society, democratic, law-abiding society, respecting of the rule of law, respecting of our values have become. And so in that with that in mind, I believe there is still a need to produce a comprehensive review of the impact of lawfare in the UK national security and its armed forces. The aim of this review could be two-folded. Uh, first, to have a better understanding of the potential as well as the risk of weaponizing the law. So where do we draw the line? Why the Americans are more proactive? You know, we are going to uh, at war uh, in coalition. We are working in coalition with us partners. What do we think they can use offensively the law? And where do we draw this line? And Second point, why is it, um, what we can do with this review uh, uh, comprehensively is to reinforce, think about how to reinforce the legal resilience of the British society. And uh, le by legal resilience, I mean two points, to identify the weaknesses of our legal system, and this is the point of now taking stock and you know, finally putting an end on this legal pursuit uh, of our troops and address them in a timely fashion, not through a decade. And second point is maybe to be more vigilant in the legal field and able to recognize, to identify before they, they come hostile legal action as quickly as possible and condemn them, like we condemn military direct action, kinetic action in the society. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I call upon uh, Lieutenant General Sir Graham Lamb to speak now. Thank you for your friendship inspiration to us through the years, Graham. <laughs> Look forward to hearing, as always, what you have to say. Yeah, yeah I, I dress for the occasion, as you can see. The, um, uh, actually, the audience have given you the sort of, I think, I think it was Kipling that said, you know, there are six, he had six honest, wise men that, uh, that he kept close. Who, what, where, when, how, and why. Actually, in fact, my good friends on the audience here, on, on the panel here, have asked the, the how, certainly the what, the who, and touched on the where and how. I thought I might just touch for a second on the why. Why this matters. At the age of 17, I passed, 1971, 
pass through the gates of the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. If you haven't been there and you get a chance, to go there. Actually, go to the chapel in the old, in, in, in old college chapel. And you will see column upon column upon column of young men and women whose names are inscribed there, who gave their last full measure of devotion to this nation in its defense. I was commissioned in 73. Queen's Commission is quite interesting. It's worth looking at if you have a chance. Yeah, I haven't really looked at it for a long time. But it is explicit guidance from Her Majesty, signed. It required me to discharge my duties carefully and diligently. It demanded that I always maintained, with, for myself and my command, good order and discipline. And it commanded that I observe and follow orders and direction according to the rules and discipline of war. So my own oath taken and four documents underwrote that for my 38 years of service for the nation. And they were the Army Act 1955, Queen's Regulations, Geneva Convention, and the Law of Armed Conflict. Be that war, operations, conflict, violent disorder, and everything in between, augmented as when necessary by special theater specific rules of engagement. That environment, that theater, in which one discharged one's duty is anything other than challenging. Napoleon Bonaparte considered the first virtue of a soldier was endurance of fatigue. Courage was the second. Thomas Hobbes insight, no arts, no letters, no society. And worst of all, the continual fear and the danger of a violent death. Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, short. That captures the environment in which we're asking young men and women, and some older, to go and act on your behalf or on the nation's behalf. And that and my decisions, my actions in 38 years, no different than any other, were towards a military clear goal, always bounded by military necessity, distinction, and proportionality. Parties are bound by the law of war to the extent that such compliance does not interfere with achieving legitimate military goals. So it is my view, in war, neither is there an obligation to kill, nor is there an obligation not to kill. Here's the conundrum. For the term peace and war are really of little use. We are and have been, for as long as I can remember, in a continuum of conflict. State, non-state, and individual actors wish to take your life, change your way of life, ruin your prosperity, and change everything. Previously in war, or in that context, uniform to uniform, force on force, generation for the last three decades, no, last three centuries, that's how we've conducted our affairs. Churchill's instructive here. There are many kinds of maneuver in war, some only of which take place upon the battlefield. Time, diplomacy, psychology, all of which are removed from the battlefield but act decisively upon it. Today, that battlefield is further blurred. Novichok, WannaCry, subversion, just keep ticking the list off. War is well below the threshold, and what we're now seeing, and a challenge to the nation, to parliament, to the people, is force on will. And that means using our own laws against us while undermining our individual and collective will while they are indifferent to them. Novichok is a good example. Parliament and the nation must not, in the next decades, find itself rewriting Churchill's opening theme to his six books on World War II which reads how the English-speaking people, through their good nature, carelessness, and unwisdom, allowed the wicked 
to rearm. So do not believe that good laws drawn from peaceful coexistence are fit for a warlike environment and arena. It is for those in uniform to fight and defend this realm. It is for Parliament and the British people to allow us. Thank you. Last but not least, Patrick Hennessy, author, barrister, former soldier. And I think, to be fair, when you're sat in between a, an admiral, a general, and a professor, it, it probably is last and least. But um, it's the latest in a, a collection of being outgunned on a panel that I, I keep for my mother. Um, uh, one of the things that the general said when we were just chatting uh, before we all sat down um, was the sort of, I think it's, um, it's Shakespeare originally, kill all lawyers, um, which, which might be seen to be a solution to some of the problems here. Um, but as um, a current uh, barrister, I'm going to try and sort of plead a more, or a more nuanced um, position. Um, I guess, I guess the, the perspective I have on this um, is interesting in, in that I served um, very briefly um, and without sort of the distinction of, of my peers, um, but at a time when uh, the army was particularly busy. I was of the sort of generation that, um, you know, I, I had a colleague who only served for five years and he did five operational tours, sort of Northern Ireland, Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan. So, you know, huge, um, uh, huge experience. Um, and, uh, and I was in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and about three years after my um, retiring got my letter from the Iraq Historical Allegations Tribunal inviting me to come in for a, a chat about, um, they were sure it wasn't anything. So I, I, I've had that experience um, firsthand. Um, but I'm now um, I'm at the bar, uh, and uh, I do quite a lot of work for uh, the MOD. Uh, and indeed, we've, we've been talking a lot about the military here, but lawfare applies, I think, equally to any sort of security dimension. So the Foreign Office and the Home Office are also caught up in um, legislation which has the potential um, to uh, impact uh, the ability of all of our security infrastructure to work. Um, and uh, so with, with those two hats on, I think, I think it is interesting. And I want to pick up on a, a couple of themes that we've looked at, um, because I think we can see, uh, firstly, that there are ways in which what we're talking about can debilitate junior command. And, and that's, that's really was, was my experience. You know, the, the people who can be potentially affected by this and the way in which this can damage our fighting power, our ability to defend ourselves, is because it will affect the actions of your, your leaders your, your corporals, your section commanders, your platoon commanders, 23-year-olds straight out of Sandhurst, up to the sort of company commanders. And, and that, that's the core. I, I, that, I'm being quite army specific, but you know, those are the guys who make the decisions which um, win and lose fights. It's the generals and the admirals that, that win and lose wars. But those are the guys you need to win the fights themselves. Uh, and a really important thing to remember when you're talking about that, and, and the last time I was here at Policy Exchange, we had um, uh, a, a sergeant from the Royal Anglians who's a really good example of this. He was talking about his experience of having been pursued after the event for uh, an action for which I think he was um, awarded a military cross. Um, and it doesn't have to be that uh, the outcome of a court case or the outcome of um, a change in the law is to prohibit an action if that's the perception for that junior commander. Uh, and one of the things that every soldier um, will be able to tell you is if the commanding officer says that the battalion has to be ready to go at seven in the morning, then the company commanders, because they don't want to be late, will say, well, everybody has to be ready at 6.30. And the platoon commanders will say, well, I don't want to be late for the company commanders, so I have to be ready at six. And by the time you've got down to the poor guardsman, he's up at four in the morning. Uh, and that is a very well-known effect. And that has real application here, because a slight tweak to the law or a slight change in direction that comes out of very nuanced, very detailed, very lengthy judgment that no one's going to really bother to read, no one's going to understand, cascades down until the perception of its effect on the, on the front line, the interpretation of a decision of the House of Lords by a Lance Corporal is what makes the difference. And it doesn't matter if he's right or wrong. If he doesn't do something that he should, and he doesn't do something that actually he's legally entitled to do because he doesn't realize, then that is really damaging. Um, I'll give you an anecdotal example. And in fact, this stems from, th this, is a, this is a vignette might illustrate the problem that we have. I was in Northwood recently, where um, the old nuclear-proof bunker was constructed for um, kind of Cold War, uh, perhaps simpler times. I don't think it's nuclear-proof now because all the doors are open all the time and they've got a shiny new glass, distinctly not nuclear-proof looking headquarters. So the only thing they have down in there are the servers where you can view certain types of um, AV footage. Um, and I, I, I did sort of think there was something slightly Ozymandias about the fact that there was this 
brilliant old bunker um, and I was pretty much the only person in it. And what I was doing was watching videos of interrogations of detainees, um, looking for moments at which the interrogator might have been deemed to swear inappropriately. We're not talking about people being physically abused. We're not talking about tables being slammed, chairs being thrown. We're not we're talking about stress positions, all of the stuff that has long gone. We're talking about was that swear word used in a way that was threatening or was it just a swear word used because the interrogator was swearing? That level of granular detail. Also important not to forget that I'm getting reasonably well paid to do this as a barrister. So the taxpayer is funding me sitting in a nuclear, no longer nuclear proof bunker, watching a video to see if an interrogator is swearing. <coughs> and it doesn't matter that he's allowed to because if he doesn't think he's allowed to or if he thinks someone's going to come after him for swearing when he shouldn't have, then he's not going to do his job properly. Um, and I think that is what we mustn't forget. All of this bleeds down to somewhere real. Um, and it may be um, the sort of um, offensive way of doing it when we think about insurgents and then claims being brought by people like Phil Shiner. That seems to be a very obvious kind of attack on how we do business. But it can happen uh, in a more insidious way where um, you can be appearing to protect the troops themselves and saying, oh, well, you know, did they have the right kit and equipment? We're going to challenge uh, the Ministry of Defence on that basis. That is an equally difficult thing because then if you think, well, I'm not going to go out on patrol unless I've got this because I might be sued afterwards for not having the right vehicle. There are really practical applications. And I'm going to finish with one more um, practical application because I think this is a really interesting point when we talk about lawfare and when we talk about some of the reforms that are proposed in Richard's paper. Um, I, I gave a talk recently to reserve uh, um, forces officers and, and retired junior officers working um, at GCHQ and we were talking afterwards about this subject generally and I was really struck by the strength of feeling they had um, of anger that the armed forces were being co-opted um, by something that they really didn't agree with. Um, the armed forces know the difference between right and wrong and can look after themselves. If you look at the two most egregious things that have come out of the, the most recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, Baha Musa and Sant Blackman uh, in Afghanistan shooting an unarmed um, and injured Taliban. Both of those things were dealt with within the framework of the, the domestic law, the law of armed conflicts, they were violations of the Geneva Conventions. They would have been dealt with exactly the same way 40 years ago. Hopefully, they'll be dealt with exactly the same way in 40 years' time. And you want to come down robustly on those people. And there's a danger in all of this narrative that the army becomes a sort of, uh, the armed forces become a victim that need protecting by being given a different standard. I don't think we want a different standard. We know the difference between right and wrong. All of us who served were able to look our troops in the eye and say, I know you know the difference between right and wrong. We want a standard that's consistently applied. We want a standard that is applied fairly and clearly. And that's what we don't have at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. could, I, could I just clarify one thing for, just for clarification? Whilst the nuclear bunker at Northwood is all completely open door and everything, within it is CTF 345, where all the doors are very firmly closed <laughs> and is very deep, and it would take a one megaton ground burst to affect it, which is on the firing chain for our deterrent. I would hate you to think that all the doors are open into three CTF 345. So, uh, we did prop one open with a bit. The doors were open to questions. <laughs> Why I just want to get a flavour of how many people. Gentlemen there by the window, please, name an organisation. Thank you. I'm Richard Bennion. I'm a member of Parliament. Uh, and over 30 years ago, I, I was in the gallery of the House of Commons uh, hearing the case of somebody who had served in the same battalion as me, who had shot someone on, in Northern Ireland, uh, being raised with the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, he'd been convicted of murder. And uh, so we mustn't think that the current issue is one that is that recent. I also have the scars on my back of trying to bring in a private member's bill uh, to, to introduce a statute of limitations for some of these cases and uh, uh, have come up against the legal uh, problems here. Uh, can I, I also have a son who has just passed through what Graham was talking about, and uh, I can assure you that, that the academics at Sandhurst very much made them question all sorts of uh, occasions when you might open fire and you might not, and the line between breaking the law and being a hero is a very, very fine one. Uh, but my question is really about Northern Ireland, and I'm really interested to see Richard's paper and the follow-up work that you're doing on this, because many of the cases, in the case of a constituent of mine who was involved in the shooting in 1974, uh, is, uh, is being brought up in a coronial inquest. The coroner's courts are, are law unto themselves, as far as I can make out. Uh, and the government can do an awful lot to stop the kind of things that 
we find so offensive, such as the uh, uh, the case against uh, uh, um, the, the, the one who's in court now. But these are these are a mu as much a part of political revisionism, uh, where there are highly contested, very controversial cases, where. Uh, old men are being taken and investigated and asked whether they were in that do doorway or this doorway and whether riflemen so-and-so opened fire before them. And inevitably, after 40 or 50 years, there is very little chance of that ending up in the courts. My question is, is there anything that we can do about that? Because all the other things the government are talking about will not stop the coronial inquests, which are now a political industry on the scale of Phil Shiner and what was happening in Iraq. Who wants to go first? Richard. I'll have a go. So thank you very much. Um, I think you're, you're dead right. In a sense, it's not all about prosecutions and prosecutions that, that get taken further. Investigations matter with a view to prosecution, and so do inquests and uh, um, inquiries and the other range of ways in which uh, events from 40, 50 years ago get, um, get uh, reopened. Some, to some extent, that's a political choice, I think. But it's a political choice often taken under duress, in a sense. Uh, insofar as uh, there's a perception with some force to it that the Human Rights Act and the European Convention, as it's uh, interpreted and given effect in our law, requires you to, uh, to satisfy Article 2, requires you to investigate, requires you to have an effective, independent, transparent investigation, even if there have been several investigations before. So I think amending the Human Rights Act and uh, ending an obligation in respect of uh, deaths that took place before October 2000 would uh, restore discretion, not, and so you wouldn't be required to carry that out. You may still need political uh, will and action, not simply to choose to carry that anyway, uh, but I think you need to remove that, um, that overhang, if you like. Anyone else want to come in? Coroner's courts, I think we did deal with it initially in the first fog of law. We had a great deal of cooperation from a great many people in a great many areas, including some surprising people who didn't share our perspective. But I think we got absolutely zero cooperation from the coroners, Tom, in the first. Uh, right. Well, uh, there's not much to add from the first one, I'm afraid. I yeah. Good. I see lots of other questions. Lady there in the middle. Name an organization, please. Hello, uh, Moira Andrews, Praetor Legal, and formerly a government legal advisor. I just wondered, uh, some of you touched on the wider aspects of national security operations rather than just military operations, and I wondered if the remedies that you were looking at um, encompassed such things as the investigations that have gone on into members of both MI5 and MI6, which have gone on for some years, alleging that they were involved in torture, none of them came to anything, but those are also pernicious in their own way. I see quite a lot of questions, so if I just take him as a brace of questions. Do I see any other hands? Sorry. Lady immediately behind you. Name an organization, please. Thank you very much. My name is Megan. I'm with the Oxford Research Group. So my question is about uh, more current warfare, and I'm curious about whether you think that there are sufficient mechanisms um, to mitigate, mitigate against risks when the UK chooses to work increasingly through partners, um, so both in regards to uh, litigation against the UK itself, like the UK's own forces, but also in regards to when we work with partners and then they're accused of IHL abuse. If you think there are enough um, safeguards in place there. Who wants to go first? Can I speak to the second question? Yeah, yeah. well, as, as many of them as you wish yeah. to answer. Yeah, I, 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 I want some. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the, the, the partnering question is really interesting and it's a great example of where what, um, what, what people who are driving um, this sort of agenda um, probably uh, think they are doing with the best of intentions is actually backfiring. Um, so I worked um, extensively um, alongside and in partner with Afghan uh, National Security Forces on a number of occasions who, um, it's fairly uncontroversial, and were not at the standard of training or professionalism in some aspects, as we were, um, and who couldn't really be expected to be either. I mean, they're brilliant fighters, but they, they, they just did things differently in some respects. Now, if I was uh, mentoring them, uh, there would be a risk um, in, in extremists that I or somebody um, in my chain of command could be held liable for actions that they took, um, you know, a joint patrol, and if they'd shot somebody, would that person um, come under um, the jurisdiction? Does it mean that that could somehow come back into the UK courts? Would that come back on me? Now, what effect that has is rather than us carrying on robustly partnering them and making sure that they didn't do things wrongly in the first place, uh, you might say, okay, let's just not bother. Let's let them go out on their own today 
uh, and then potentially do something far worse or do something that they wouldn't have done if we had been there. And I, I think it's a really good example of how um, the sort of campaigning zeal that underlies um, some of this sort of problem, which is um, largely well-intentioned. I mean, yes, you've got the tank chasers, but this is also people who are trying to do what they think is the right thing. But in practical terms, it actually doesn't work. And I can't foresee, and there are people who, who have better kind of sight of the, the big issues than I do, but I can't foresee a time when that sort of coalition work, partnering work, is not going to be part of, of overseas deployment. So that, that continues to be an issue. Graham. Yep, I mean, I, I'm, on Moira's question, you're absolutely right. The answer is that, that you know, Throughout my career, I found myself in good company, and, and they weren't all wearing uniform. Um, I remember going to GCHQ to, to, to hand out um, acknowledged medals, which they had won, you know, so one could relate to the families of just what a significant contribution those other services made to saving our lives. So, so the same safeguards, the same issues are as relevant, in my view, to, they, to the, all those organizations that find themselves in harm's way as it is us. It also probably applies to DFID and others who are in fact in that sort of, you know, on, 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 the, on the peripheral but caught up in that level of violence. So, so absolutely with that question. I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name of the lady behind you, but, but partners, just, just, just to add, um, you know, it's, it's your abs you know the, 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 the conundrum is exactly that. What, what do you do? Well, if you don't have partners, you don't have, a you don't have a transition plan. So in which case, we own the problem forever. Yeah? And the second one is be under no illusion as to how often and how many of them die, while in fact saving our lives and actually progressing you know, in, a, in a complicated way business. I can think of a unit we had in, in Iraq uh, and one we had in Afghanistan of which I think virtually every one of those, every one of them, is dead. They were without a break in combat operations forever, and they did their duty. So actually, in fact, if we can help them with technology, we can help them with intelligence, we can help them with that. Actually, what's really important, if we can help them in education, all the rest of it. But I absolutely acknowledge that it comes with a risk, because the answer is they are culturally quite different to us. And so it is based upon us. What you don't have is three years or 10 years to train them in order to be fit for a legal standard which aligns with us. So it's, a, it's, it's, this, it's just this a conundrum. Alan. Yes, I mean, in terms of the um, SIS and security service, um, it, is, it is highly complex, and, and a lot of it relates to working with allies and things. When, when I was producing the new standard for how our agents had to operate when I was in the Home Office. I mean, one of the problems was, for example, if in uh, somewhere up north of Baghdad, a, a, a team of RSF, on, on evidence from, a, from the SIS, went in and captured three people, they had no ability of putting those people back through British lines to come back. They had to hand them over to Americans, and Americans had totally different rules for how they were treating people, so immediately they were guilty of rendition. Um, you know, this was a, this, so this was a real problem. And, and, and getting around that is very, very difficult because, it, again, it's, 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 it's a law of unseen, unforeseen circumstance. It became very, very difficult to make sure, you know, our people, yes, they might well have put in a, in, before we changed the rules, put in some questions. These questions were then put by Americans in a way that we would never put questions, and, you know, ever. Um, and in a way, they were one removed from it, and it was, I think, it was a little harsh that some of them were actually focused on for having given the questions that we needed an answer for, which might, which might you know, be important for the safety of our own people. Um, I think we've got around that, but it's very difficult. And it's very difficult when you're working out. I Similarly at sea, if you're in operation at sea, you do find, believe it or not, that some ships of another nation have different rules of engagement from yours when you're in the same operation. So for example, you know, if, if an enemy radiates on a fire control radar and opens its missile doors, our rules of engagement might say you can lock on but not fire. You might find that the Americans say you'll sink it. And, and, that, and you are the part of it because you're, you're there. You know, it, is, it is quite difficult. It is quite difficult to extract yourself from that alliance grouping when these things are happening. Thank you. Other question? Lady at the back there, gentleman at the front. So just wait for the microphone so we can hear you. 
thank you. It's uh, Lucy Fisher from The Times. Um, I suppose this is a question more for the parliamentarians, but I wanted to ask why you think um, there's been zero progress in the past uh, several years. Is it because it's not been a priority for Theresa May and her administration, or is it the legal complexities? Um, and secondly, um, any thoughts on the current candidates in the Tory leadership contest <laughs> uh, and their commitment <laughs> to solving this problem? That one's for General Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman at the front, name and organisation, please. James Spencer, AIG. Um, two thoughts, if I may, very briefly. Uh, 25 odd years ago, I was in Belfast. Uh, I was given a monocular night vision goggle and a laser pointer uh, to trial on the streets. Um, I could not get the lawyers to tell me whether firing a round with that device counted as a single aimed shot or not. If we're going to ask our people to do this, we need to give them the backup. That's something the British Armed Forces can do. The second thing, um, I've heard lots about the European H Court of Human Rights. I've heard absolutely nothing about the International Criminal Court. Tony Blair took us into that and then into wars of choice. The defense against committing somebody to that organization is that we have tried them rigorously and robustly in our own system, which is probably a fairer shake than we're going to get in that court. So um, I think we need to be very careful about uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater and giving them imp impunity. Uh, the third question is, um, if I may, or it's actually qu the first question, have we seen lawfare um, in any other theatres with terrorists using uh, law to try and achieve what they couldn't do by violence? If I can turn to this panel of political innocence, Lord of the West. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you, Lucy. Um, I'm not going to comment on the, on the Tory uh, leadership contest. Um, Why not? Everyone else has. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm unusual in Parliament. I try to only speak on things I know something about, which is quite unusual, and I don't really know enough about it to be able to say something. Um, but I watch with horror, that's all I'll say. Um, uh, I, I'm just reminding your first question. I was going to comment on that one. Yeah, I think... Th yes, thank you. I think, actually, I don't think there's been a... I, I, I don't think that people have felt they really... It's important enough to them. I mean, they make, they make statements about it being important uh, at the right moment, but I don't believe that really, they really see it as one of the really, really important issues. I think there are so many other issues milling around that seem much more important. But actually, I think this is a pretty damned important one. It's very important for the military. Uh, and because the military aren't involved to the extent that they were when Afghanistan and things were going on, I think they've been able to just drift, drift away from it and not do anything. Um, if you make it, if you make it absolutely clear this is going to affect whether they get elected or not, whether they get their seat back as an MP, then my goodness me, it's amazing how much focus they put on it. Um, how we can achieve that is quite difficult. You know, there's no doubt military is on the back burner. You know, people love in, in, a, in a sort of, in, in a vague sense, they rather like, you know, you know, Jack and Tom, you know, they, 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 they love the military people, but they're not interested in spending more money on defence. They're not really interested in the nuances about defence or the nuances about it. And until we get that, until we get politicians really feeling this is really, really important, um, I don't believe it'll move forward. And somehow we've got to try and achieve that. Richard Eakins. Uh, I'm probably not competent to answer Lucy's question, but I want to attempt to speculate that it might be parliamentarians are sometimes uh, scared of the lawyers. Uh, so the risk of entanglement with complex, or look, look, complex legal issues is, uh, is off-putting. You mean secretaries of state with MOD lawyers? Oh, no, I was thinking uh, is that a more broadly. Well? That's probably a problem as well. It's true, and the advice one receives, if you are a Secretary of State, I expect is often highly conservative, that you can't uh, step on, you can't take certain actions because the risk of adverse judgment in our courts or in Strasbourg is, is unthinkable. You can't go there, even if some of the action you're taking will be to restore the legal position as it was just a few years ago. Uh, um, in relation to the second question, I, mean, I agree the ICC is definitely an important part of the story. I don't think the, um, the alternative to our existing arrangements, though, is impunity. Uh, it's a restoration of the primacy of the law of armed conflict, I think, in which, by all means, as, as Patrick has said and others have, you investigate certain allegations and you uh, prosecute them to the, the full reach of the law. Uh, the question is, how far does that require the, um, the judicial supervision of investigations and requiring reinvestigations over time? There'd be multiple investigations. <laughs> Uh, how far does it require domestic legal risk, which does change uh, how, uh, uh, how things are uh, carried out? Uh, one final point, too, maybe. The Ministry of Defence is not a department, I think, that's terribly used to 
uh, a series of, of lawsuits or to legislating. It's not like the Home Office. So you may have a difficulty there in departmental culture, perhaps. But again, that's speculation. Tom. Um, on the question of Tory leaders, look, I've spoken to uh, one of them about it. Uh, and uh, certainly Michael Gove has been in the past extremely supportive of this. This is something that we've uh, spoken about when he was Lord Chancellor. It was something that he pushed but uh, wasn't there for very long. I, I think this is one of those areas that uh, became clearly important in 1415 uh, 15, and then with the end of major combat operations in Afghanistan sort of slipped below the radar and pressure from uh, lawyers uh, to the Secretaries of State uh, led them to believe that status quo was easier than challenging um, the legal opinion. Uh, so I think that's largely the reason it hasn't moved. Um, I think you've heard pretty clearly why we, many of us feel that it really must move and must move now. Um, the other questions were uh, really about um, clarity and cooperation. And one of the things that I'm, I'm struck by in, in all of this is we are looking today actively, immediately, at a conflict in which lawfare uh, is probably being used to a certain extent, and that's in Ukraine. Now, it's actually not being used against us, but it's being used against uh, various organizations that have deployed forces out there. And the uh, Russian state is supporting and paying for lawyers uh, to challenge deployments of other nations in Ukraine and to challenge the way in which they are deployed. Yeah. Now, it is hardly beyond the wit of uh, the Russian intelligence staff to find a soldier in Her Majesty's Armed Forces uh, who could be influenced to bring a case against a superior <laughs> on the use of their equipment or the issuance of their kit of any description and in doing so seek to, at the very least, damage the morale of the troops, but at the most actually make deployments impossible. Um, certainly with the uh, role of Her Majesty's Armed Forces in uh, Estonia today and our role in training uh, Ukrainians uh, today, <coughs> uh, you can see why they might decide that that was worth doing. Uh, and so I don't think that this is a, uh, an additional aspect. And while uh, naturally um, senior officers over the last 20 years have focused on buying large things that go bang, uh, the focus on actually allowing the soldiers, sailors, and airmen to use them uh, is now the most important aspect, I would argue, of senior command in the armed forces. Graham, Julie, yep. then we'll get to uh, Just quickly, I, I, I won't touch on the old party political part or the uh, the, uh, the like the um but on the lawfare and examples um i suppose i've never not seen it if i go back to northern ireland i could think of cases in court where you had somebody who survived an amber whatever the case may be the uh, uh from the prussian ira of which the questions that were being asked were nothing to do with trying to actually in fact what i call prove his innocence it was all about trying to find how we had got the intelligence when we got it how we had got it in order to, in fact, basically there for their own kind to find out who the touts and therefore the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the spies within their own camp had come through. If I look towards counter-narcotics, again, prevalent as it went through that, I look towards all the major Balkans, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, if you take it from on one end from a straightforward morale issue, you know, all part and parcel of that, but actually it's not only just the enemy. You know, a good example, if you turn around and see that how a reluctance to enact law, um, the, the institutional inertia, which came with Rwanda and Kosovo, both brought about R2P, <coughs> right to protect, um, in many ways. So, so, so those delays are not by the enemy. They're just, in fact, what I call in, no, no, we need to have another committee while... I don't know, Rwanda was what, 800,000 in nine months, chopped to pieces, so. Julie. Yes, real quick to answer your question about lawfare here, uh, yeah, about terrorists, you know, using lawfare and uh, to their, you know, on a strategic uh, uh, purpose. Uh, yes, I mean, we have many examples, whether it is Hamas uh, using human shield uh, against uh, Israel Defense Forces, uh, 
uh, on schools, on civilian, uh, you know, uh, uh, places. Uh, whether it is also in during the Libyan campaign, uh, some uh, hospital were using. So all this uh, civilian objective, you are not allowed to target. And we law-abiding nation applying. So when you apply rules of engagement, compliance with law of armed conflict and everything, you are not targeting this. They are using by the enemy, by the adversaries. So to change the course of action, to change all the campaigns planned uh, in advance, so and we keep adapting to this situation. So this is typically a, a lawfare, uh, you know, uh, activities, tactics uh, used, you know, widely. Uh, it's, yeah. Thank you. Final questions. Edward Folks. Uh, Edward Folks. Um, I think I might have the answer to Lucy's question, and yeah. the answer mm. to so many political questions is Brexit. <laughs> Uh, why is it Brexit? Well, um, I spent about six months with Dominic Raab working on a British Bill of Rights, which has not seen the light of day, which incorporated some of the changes of the sort that's discussed in Richard Eakin's <coughs> paper. And I genuinely think that had the referendum gone the other way, uh, David Cameron would have announced the consultation paper which we'd prepared and would have introduced legislation which would have dealt with some of these issues. Unfortunately, uh, that did not come to pass. Can I possibly ask one question? Uh, on a previous policy exchange uh, session, we used the expression legal freeloading. I wonder if the panel would like to comment on whether we are in the position wh whereby, because of our particular legal system, we are now getting an international reputation as being risk averse or in any way compromising our capacity to take part in, uh, in combat. Thank you. Patrick, Tom. I mean, I, yeah, I think we, we see that. I think um, we saw it in the latter phases of um, the uh, conflict in Iraq, where the Americans uh, had just come to the view that actually it was simpler and more straightforward for them to do things without having to kind of bring us on board. Um, we saw it in a practical sense in southern Afghanistan, where they were able, uh, yes, of course, with their resources, but, but also with their slightly different approach to operations to um, create effect that we just, we simply couldn't. Um, it's very difficult to unpick, you know, what's, what's more or, or less of a factor. Is it, our, is it risk aversion? Is it, is it resourcing? But I think we definitely see that. I've certainly had conversations with American politicians uh, in the last four years. Um, many of whom have grown up, as I have politically, in uh, operational service in Iraq or Afghanistan, and had conversations about this because it is, <coughs> it is true that we rely on each other's intelligence in the Five Eyes community. We rely on each other's defense networks in not just NATO, but much further afield than that. And if we're not willing to allow our forces to operate under what I think most people would consider normal rules of engagement, as in uh, the Geneva Conventions, the laws of armed conflict, international uh, humanitarian law, then effectively what we're doing is we're loading up the Americans and actually the French to an extent to, to carry that burden for us. Uh, it's interesting that uh, French legal opinion over recent years uh, certainly, I mean, it would, be, it would be completely wrong to say it gives any uh, blanket immunity in any way at all to French uh, intelligence or military personnel, but certainly gives a more practical uh, ability to many to be able to conduct operations which are fundamentally in defense of us all. So there is a danger, and of course the, 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 there is a consequent danger to it, which is uh, alliances are based on the mutual sharing of burdens. Um, for some countries, they're small enough that, frankly, you carry them because it would be wrong not to. But for countries that are large enough to bear that burden, who choose not to, well, the relationship changes, and you either become a client or you become an irrelevance. Brad. Yeah, I, I would just add that, that um, yeah, I, I, I increasingly find the risk bar has been dropped down to a blame bar, which is very, very low. And I can think of a particular case recently where, where um, I saw merely a withdrawal of, 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 of permission to give advice against an al nusra Daesh situ target case, which would have helped individuals because it was a safe decision not to. 
and I thought, truly unworthy. Uh, I mean, I think that absolutely is that perception. A lot of my American friends have it. I think, as, as was just mentioned, the, I think the Americans and the French are much more robust than we are. Um, and, and, and I'm afraid an absolutely disgraceful example of it in the naval sense was in 2007 in the Northern Gulf, which was an absolute disgrace. The job of our forces is to kill the Queen's enemies. It's not to make some sort of judgment, oh, am I going to get into trouble if I shoot now? Um, and that was a disgraceful episode, and it, it reflected very badly on the Royal Navy. I think it reflected badly on our military, and there have been other cases as well, and, and I think it is a real danger. Final question. I'm sorry if I disappoint anyone. Do I see anyone else wanting to ask anything? Gentlemen there, name an organization. Wait for them. Justin Bowen, I'm associated with the IISS and was a, uh, a government official. Um, I'd just like to um, kind of put a bit of emphasis on this business of impunity. I mean, it does seem to me that the other half um, of giving proper protection to the armed forces is making sure that when there are um, inappropriate activities, there is proper um, judicial um, process around it. And, and I don't think that the Ministry of Defence has done very well. I mean, if you think about Deep Cut, if you think about Bloody Sunday, I mean, clearly the Widgery report was completely um, uh, a whitewash and Saville came to a very different conclusion. So I think it's really important that there isn't um, impunity, um, as it were, as a matter of fact. It's no good saying, as one of our colleagues said there, that soldiers know what's right and wrong. I know that. But sometimes things go wrong and action has to be taken. Thank you. I'm just hating to disagree with Desmond for a moment. I think Lord Bew, who is a historical advisor of the Bloody Sunday Commission, has pointed out that the final outcome was not so very different from Lord Widgery, and that Widgery was not in the sense of the described a whitewash, but uh, there might be disagreement in his sign of the contentiousness of these issues, that even on so fundamental a historical point, there can be a divergence here. Last, uh, last orders from our... Can I, can I pick up that point? Because I, I think that was what um, I was... I maybe didn't articulate it clearly enough. The, the people I speak to who are still serving are very against the idea that they're being seen to request some sort of impunity. What they're saying is, we are capable of enforcing the standards. You know, we, we know the importance of those standards. Um, and, and we don't want uh, that, which has always, well, always, no, there, you know, there are exceptions, and you've, you've noted them, but they should remain exceptions. We don't want that to be either contracted out um, or our agenda hijacked by really, quite, frank, kind of quite unpleasant elements who would say, yeah, yeah, you know, our brave boys should have immunity from anything at all. Um, and I think this ties into the same problem that was developing in the late noughties, where because we were trying to support um, the services and support servicemen and women who've been injured. Um, I think it was General Rob Fry who kind of came up with this idea, hang on, we, we shouldn't be victims. You know, yes, servicemen get injured, but the relentless press focus on Headley Court had created this thing where suddenly your instant association with, with, a, with a serviceman was, was as, you know, sort of in rehabilitation. The instant, the instant um, association now is as somebody who's being persecuted for something they did or didn't do 30 years ago, and, and neither of those is healthy. We don't want to be victims. We should be, I think, vi victors, not victims, was Rob Fry's thing. But then you've got to let the military do it themselves. So I, I completely agree, and, and impunity is, is not what is being sought, and that should be the, the first point that is made. If you've done something wrong, then you come down and you're like a ton of bricks. Graham. Yeah, I mean, I, the, 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 the assumption is that, you know, everybody in a uniform is a hero. You know, you, you, Desmond, you know as well as I do, you know, that, that people like me are no angels. So, um, uh, but the question is whether, in fact, that, the, you know, the chain of command genuinely, and it, and it always needs and constantly reinforced, that actually the idea of diligence, of good order and discipline, of oversight and appropriate, that, that at no point in time do they are put in a position where they would do anything other than act properly. Because the truth of the matter is that, that for people like me, you know, if I look at someone like, you know, if you look at Abu Ghraib, for instance, on the American side, an inappropriate action, I hate to think how many tens of thousands of lives that have been taken and lost because of that incredibly, you know, just unbelievable approach. But, but, but the truth of the matter is that, that, that and, the, and, the sh and the shock to the US military, you know, has taken a long time to try and clear those decks. And so the truth of the matter is that, that I think we just need to constantly reinforce it amongst ourselves 
And then the idea, and I remember having a conversation with Jim Mattis, General Mattis, an old friend. Yeah, and we both said, you know, if somebody, there was a case that he was dealing with, you know, where, where quite clearly a U.S. Marine had crossed the line, you know, the answer is we are more than comfortable of putting them in jail and throwing away the key forever. So, so that sort of sense that goes right through and says, if you're caught, then the answer is we will see to you. And because you have damaged the integrity, the sort of under 300 years of history, I keep taking the list off here. This is something that truly upsets us and is wrong. Anyone else? But, but, well, I, all I would add, I mean, I, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, uh, and, uh, and it is correct and proper that we should, people should be, uh, you know, take, go through a judicial process if they've done something very wrong. But I still believe our, our default mechanism to start with should be that we're on the side of our people way more so than saying we are absolutely dead straight. You know, yes, all right, you've got, if they break the law, then it's got to go through a proper judicial process. But we should be bending over backwards to look after our people. And I think particularly in terms of ranks as well. I mean, in the Navy, if someone on your ship does something wrong, very often the captain is court-martialed. Even you won't even bloody well there because they're your people. It does seem extraordinary. We can have a private taken to court for something and no one above him, an NCO, officer or anybody, seems to have had anything to do with that. I find it quite remarkable. Um, so I do think we've got to be careful at, at times. Thank you. It's been a fantastic panel discussion. We'll be proud to put it out. We're proud to play our part in this debate. There's been huge interest uh, from abroad in this uh, work from a number of uh, foreign militaries. Academics will continue uh, to pursue it. There's also, as been pointed out, continuing political interest across various political dividing lines in the Conservative leadership contest as well. Boris Johnson has written about it. Other candidates have expressed uh, interest in the subject and as part of our role in forging a new national consensus on this and other topics, we'll continue to keep it at the top of the agenda. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for our panelists for uh, taking the time to come today, some for traveling a long way, from a long way away. And we look forward to welcoming you all back soon. Thank you. Yeah. Another good work. <laughs>